Welcome to another episode of 360 here in our vision studio. I am Muhammad Noor. We have a very special guest from 45 Ride, Matthew Smith. Uh, he doesn't need introduction. Everybody knows him, what he does and what they do. So here we are in Malaysia. Uh, we're going to talk about a uh, recent report and the uh, role of uh, 45 rides across the, across the world in Bangladesh and other parts of the world as well. And uh, what Burma and accountability and uh, how this report is going to help. So thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, in a very short notice. So uh, we just want to know about uh, the recent report, uh, how it came about and what, uh, where, where has it been launched and what are the response? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just, just to say at the outset, we, we recognize that nobody knows better than the Rohingya people about the genocide that's, that's, that's being experienced. And what we're trying to do with our reports is to ensure that the wider international community is also aware of the crimes that the community has been experiencing for so long. So back in July 2018, we released a report on the genocide, the crime of genocide in Myanmar, finding there's reasonable grounds um, and evidence about this crime, naming perpetrators from the Myanmar army and police who should be investigated and prosecuted for genocide. Uh, this recent report is focused on the period from 2012 to 2015 when there were, uh, of course, quite a lot of, of Rohingya leaving Rakhine yes. State and Bangladesh by, by sea. Um, what we found uh, is that uh, human traffickers were working very closely with the authorities in, in exactly. Thailand. We found Thai authorities committing violations against, uh, uh, against Rohingya refugees. Rather than protecting the refugees, they were subjecting them to further human rights violations. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 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 this particular report we did in partnership with the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia called Suhakam. Suhakam. And, um, uh, and the hope is that uh, we will see some accountability for the crimes that Rohingya people suffered here in Malaysia. In terms of the report, of we have seen uh, multiple reports uh, published all around the world. Uh, but uh, a lot of Rohingya uh, wonder also at the same time, this, the impact of it, like what can it bring to them on the table uh, or, or how soon this can happen as, as you can see the situation is devastating for Rohingya everywhere. Absolutely. I think the, in terms of human rights documentation, uh, from our perspective, it's an exercise in truth telling. And so, you know, we don't even think about these reports necessarily as a fortify rights report. These are reports that are really made up of the voices of survivors uh, in these situations who are, who are um, in some cases, taking great risk to talk about what they've experienced, to share evidence. And that's really what these reports are about. They're vehicles for the Rohingya people to speak truth about what they've experienced and to demand justice. And so um, uh, in terms of the impact, I think, um, you know, we always say that, uh, um, that uh, the Rohingya people, there are a lot of people who have been involved in documenting the violations, but certainly uh, Rohingya media, our vision, and others, uh, Rohingya people who were sharing their experience about what, they've, what, what happened and what the Myanmar authorities have been doing to them, um, this is really what has driven the global attention about what's going on in Rakhine State, what's going on in Bangladesh. And so I think... Um, the people who have been involved in that work uh, uh, should be should be commended. Uh, the, the the in terms of change, you know, there's there are various accountability mechanisms now. As I think you're aware, the ICC is getting involved, uh, yes. and right. a lot of this really comes back to people from the community resisting these violations, talking about uh, uh, what they've done, participating in that truth telling process. So I think the reports play a role. They play there. It's not a silver bullet, uh, so to speak. It's not the, the the single solution, but it's part of a much broader process but, towards yes. justice. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, one of the we have seen a couple of reports also uh, from the Forty Five Rights. But beside that, if you can explain uh, what Forty Five's role and what it does, mm -hmm. and for for any layman to understand what is your role. Uh, and what fortify, what is the description basically of fortify rights? Well, you know, the international human rights movement as we know it today is, is actually in its infancy. It's not that it's only been around for a few decades. And uh, at fortify rights, we believe 
the human rights movement. It's time for the human rights movement to evolve. And we think that, uh, you know, the, the, the people who are closest to the problems are closest to the solutions as well. Um, to, to borrow a phrase from, from some of our activist friends in the U.S. And so uh, what we're trying to do at Fortify Rights, we do three things. So we're trying to support human rights defenders, uh, people who are working for human rights, whether they're Rohingya or Kachin or Shan or Thai or Malay, Bangladeshi, uh, support human rights defenders. So this can come in the form of trainings or workshops, um, sometimes uh, facilitating access uh, to people in power or other people that wouldn't otherwise be accessible. Second thing that we're doing is investigation. So we're doing independent human rights investigations, and this is the more public side of our work, uh, the reports and, and news releases and, and articles um, that, that the team at Fortify Rights is producing. The third aspect of the work is engagement. And so we're, we're engaging governments, people in power. This is most effective when uh, it involves and is led by Rohingya people themselves. And so what we try to do is combine these three aspects of the work. And when we do that, we have seen some incremental positive changes. Um, it still needs to be scaled up, but, uh, but this is the idea behind Fortify Rights. Uh, thank you for, for you know, clarifying the role and importance and how uh, this... So now, uh, I mean, I, I do have a few uh, questions which is not really uh, related to this is uh, in terms of Rohingya capacity building. Mm -hmm. Rohingya, of course, now uh, need a lot of leadership, a lot of moving forward, carrying some of the burden on their own shoulder, especially those who are in diaspora, in, in uh, resettled in third countries and all this. So uh, what Fortify uh, can play, uh, what type of role they can play to bring uh, Rohingya leadership or train them and putting them into more one unified uh, kind of platform or how to move forward. Do you uh, foresee any kind of, because you are, you're, you're saying that one of your initiative is supporting human rights defenders. So we have a lot of human rights defenders. So how can we put this in, at least on a consensus base on a, on a particular platform, not necessarily a unified body, but a coalition type where they can move forward. What, what are you doing in it and what role can you play? It's a great question. Uh, you know, this is something we spend a lot of time thinking about. How can we best support uh, the community and, and human rights defenders in the Rohingya community? And I think uh, uh, there are a few things. One, one of our core competencies as an organization is human rights documentation. So for those particular people within the community that are documenting human rights violations, pressing for change, I think we can offer s certain support, uh, specific types of support to individuals or organizations like that. But beyond that, uh, what we found with uh, the Rohingya community is there's, there's great um, strength and potential simply in convening people. And so what we're trying to do is just convene people. And most of the time, Fortify Rights isn't even in the room. We'll just provide some sort of space or, or time or platform for members of the Rohingya community to come together and, and determine for themselves what they want to achieve and what direction they want to go. Um, and, uh, and, and I think there's great potential. I think a lot of that was happening before uh, the fact-finding mission was established, for example. You know, that, that, that really, uh, in some ways, at least in part, there was a lot, of a lot of moving parts around the world, but the direct involvement of Rohingya human rights activists saying, deciding that that is a the direction they wanted to go, and then going towards that direction uh, ultimately helped achieve that investigation. I mean, uh, last not the least, as we have very short uh, slot, uh, in terms of accountability, when we talk about the perpetrators, naming them specifically the generals and police officers and those who committed mass rape crimes and all those things. So uh, a lot of people have been listing out their names. So in terms of accountability, as a Rohingya, as a layman, does not understand uh, all this legal issue and process and all this. All they just need is justice. They are, are looking for a justice. So how to uh, convince them and how it's going to come and how long it will take, what are the process, or uh, basically with the, those people who died, they need some sort of answers. Now they said there's enough of evidence there is a genocide, but the, there's no complicity yet, there's no proper action taken against them. So everybody is asking, even though it's a very lengthy process, but if you could summarize it in a, in a way that people understand and mm -hmm. satisfy that, yes, the justice is coming, but this is going to come in this way, not like, you know, immediately one-off kind of thing. 
I, I think one important thing to think about is the alternative to justice, which is impunity. And, and impunity is something, unfortunately, that uh, ethnic communities in Myanmar, including the Kachin and Shan and Karen and Mon and Chin and others, impunity is something that uh, uh, is entrenched in Myanmar. And so I think impunity right now is, is not an option uh, for anybody in Myanmar. Um, and uh, the, 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 for a very long time, and this is something the Rohingya people know better than anyone, the wheels of justice were not moving at all. Uh, so now what we're seeing is that the wheels of justice are just starting to move. And so what we want to do is, is try to facilitate that process, not just a single solution, not just the ICC, but other sorts of options as well. Uh, and, and documenting the violations, collecting evidence, uh, determining who specifically is responsible for these violations is, is very crucial. Prosecutors will eventually um, draw on that information to help direct their own inquiries. Uh, and so I think uh, to the extent that um, there are members of the Rohingya community who are willing and able to participate in that process, I think there's great value in it. Um, and it's hard to say how long exactly the process will take. Um, I think uh, justice in this particular situation definitely won't come overnight. Uh, and I think there are a lot of other solutions out there as well for the Rohingya community. Uh, however, uh, I think it is absolutely essential to end these violations, to restore Rohingya citizenship, to make sure that Rohingya people can uh, live the lives they should be living. Uh, justice will absolutely be important for that. Uh, thank you very much. We are uh, at the end of our program. Thank you for uh, being here. Matthew Smith from Fortify Rights. Thank you so much.